Well, a very good morning to you. This comes from the Surrey Hills, and my name is Ian Sneller. I'm an elder at Christchurch Fetcham. Unbelievably, this is the 12th lockdown service that we've put together, and it doesn't seem like that in some senses, but uh, in other senses, I expect some people feel it's been a very long time. Uh, I trust you've had a good week and that you're keeping well. We're going to enjoy a service together. John will be preaching to us from Ephesians a little later on. Let me commit our time together to prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Our Father, we thank you once again that we are able to meet together in a virtual way to hear what you might have to say to us. We thank you that you are a great God. You are one who knows everything. You know each of our lives. You know each of our pain, each of our sorrows. You know all things about us. Nothing is hidden. And we thank you that you see right into the very corners of our hearts. You see everything. You see things that we don't even see about ourselves. So we know that you are one who is great. We thank you that we can uh, meet together as a church, as part of the great body here on earth. And we thank you for your blessings to us each day. We ask now that we would be able to enjoy this service together, that the children would hear uh, what is to be said, that the children's talk would help them in their walk, and that together we would enjoy listening to your word being explained. Bless our time now, we do ask in Jesus' name. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see t'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how pray did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns and in love amazing grace the Lord has promised good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy reigns Unending love Amazing my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbid to shine but God 
God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You are forever. Well, I thought this morning we'd do a book review. It's something that we often do at church. So I've chosen three books that I've been reading uh, during this lockdown period. They're stories of individuals from three very different continents in this world. The first one is a gentleman who was converted to Christianity from Hinduism in the 1960s in India, South India. And the next one's about an African man who had a very interesting or difficult upbringing. And the third one, you will all be familiar, I'm sure, with the name Hudson Taylor, uh, the famous uh, man who had a heart for China, to evangelise China, uh, was a missionary to that country. So let's start with Brahmin Reborn. That's this book here, and it's written by Bhaskar Sirinagam, and it's about this man who was born into a Hindu family in southern India, uh, brought up very religiously. He followed all the religious things and went to the temples and did all the things he was supposed to do. But he was very concerned as to where his life was going to go. In Hindu uh, religion, you are you come back to this world as another creature. And he kept asking what was after being a man, what was the better thing than a man, becoming a man rather than an animal, and he got no answers from people. Anyway, he eventually came uh, into contact with some uh, Christians, and he realised that Jesus was the answer, Jesus was the only answer, and he converted to Christianity, became a Christian. Uh, he lost his family initially through that, uh, they didn't want to know him, but uh, he did eventually uh, get it back with them. But it's a great book about uh, someone in a completely different culture to our own. Brahmin Re Reborn, let me commend that to you. Now the next one is about a man called Stephen Lungu, Out of the Black Shadows. This one also is an autobiography, so he's written it. Stephen, as a young child, was born into a township in Zimbabwe, uh, then known as Rhodesia and led a very difficult childhood. His father left home when he was very young, leaving his young mother to look after him and his brother and sister. His mother couldn't cope any longer when he was seven years old, and she left him by the roadside in a town, aged seven. He went off and tried to get back to his auntie, who also rejected him, made him live in the chicken coop, and he ran away and eventually after just about surviving, joined a gang and got into drugs and he was searching bins for food all the time, living under a bridge. But one day he came in contact with some Christians, but not in a good way, in the sense that he was voluntarily attending the meeting. What he wanted to do was to firebomb the marquee that the uh, mission was being held in in the town. And he and his friends sat there ready to uh, cause all sorts of trouble. And he was convicted by the preacher, so much so that he gave his heart to Jesus that night. And the story then tells of his life uh, becoming uh, a worker for God. And eventually he headed up something called African Enterprise, which was supported by churches worldwide, a very big and important organisation. That's the book. You can get that and the other one and the third one I'm going to look at in a moment from 10 of those, which uh, is a good organisation to support at this time. They're very readable. You could read them probably uh, in a day if you set, set your mind to it. Um, now, the third one is um, a, a biography of Hudson Taylor. It's this one here. It's written by Roger Steer 
and it's about Hudson Taylor and his desire to go to the continent of China to evangelise. A great story. Getting to China was difficult in those days, taking six months by boat only through uh, difficult seas, pirates, all the rest of it. And Hudson Taylor went there at a very young age of something like 21, 22. He'd partly qualified as a doctor, but not fully. And he reached out, not only in medical terms, helping people with their medical problems, but also he spread the gospel uh, throughout the country, initially on the coast where he was based, but later on he was to go into the interior. And now I'm only halfway through this book, as you can see, but uh, really good, uh, difficult to put down. So I thoroughly recommend this book by Hudson Taylor. And you can get all three from 10 of those. So I recommend you did that. Well, John's going to bring the message to us in the moment from Ephesians 1 uh, about knowing the love of Christ and understanding the riches that Christ brings to us. So I hope you'll enjoy that time. And thanks very much to John for his efforts and time that it takes to put these things together. I trust you have a good week. Thank you. Right then, children, can I have your attention for a minute? Uh, I wonder, have you ever had to do a show and tell at school? You know, where you take something in that you own or that you've made and you show it to your class. But what you take in says a lot about you, doesn't it? And it tells your class about you as you tell them about it and and uh, why you like it so much. It's a really nice thing to do, isn't it? And I remember my children used to like doing it uh, when they were at school. Uh, and Josh would often take uh, Lego in that he'd built, uh, that he'd taken a long time to make and, and that he was really proud of. Well, today we're going to see in our passage that it that, that God really likes a good show and tell. And his favourite show and tell is the church. God loves to show and tell people all about the church. Because what our passage today tells us is that God's big plan was to build his church, to build and transform a a group of people from all around the world and, and all across history who would love him and love each other in unity because they're trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for them. And we'll see that God's show and tell takes place in the heavenly places. And when God shows off the church to the heavenly places, it reveals to the devil that God has won. That through Jesus, his plan has been completed and his people have put their trust in him. And we're going to find out a little bit more about this later. Before the world began God made a master plan to bring all things together under one head. That head is Jesus Christ, who died and rose to life. And now he's seated at the right hand of God. Once we were dead in sin, now we are raised with him. By grace we're saved through faith. Part of his body now, united by his power, joined with his people all over the world. We are the church, have you heard? He washed us clean. Let's go.
in Christ One hope, one truth, one cross, one saviour One mission, one future, we are one in Christ This morning, I am reading Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13 and 20 to 21. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on the behalf of you Gentiles, assume that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and the members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though, I'm the very least of all the saints. The grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages, God in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God may now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That was according to the eternal purpose that is realised in Christ Jesus our God in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So now I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within him, within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work in us. What a wonderful verse. It's the sort of verse that you might find on a a fridge magnet or on a poster uh, with a waterfall and a, a rainbow behind it. Maybe you've got one of these at home. It is a wonderful verse, isn't it? But do you ever struggle a little believing it in reality? Does it reflect how you genuinely feel about God and what he can do? Because I don't know about you, but I've thought and imagined quite a lot about what God could do in my life. But I've also doubted, I've doubted in equal measure that these things will really happen. If I said, imagine in our first service back after lockdown, God bringing a hundred people into our church and, and them all becoming Christians. We can imagine it, couldn't we? But we might be thinking deep down, yeah, but it won't happen. So there's a problem with this verse as well, isn't there? 
If we're honest, maybe we have more of a problem with this verse than our fridge magnets give away. As we consider the future of our church, it's difficult not to let our hopes and dreams of what God might do be knocked by doubt. When we look around us, we we can start to question whether God is really at work. Maybe we haven't seen anyone come to know Jesus for a while. Maybe we thought that someone was listening, that they were getting close and then they turned away. I mean, when I think about our plans as a church, I have some big visions and my imagination can often run off with itself. But then I find myself thinking, yeah, but will God do this? Can God do this? Often I'm guilty of stopping short in my dreams and imaginations because I start to wonder if they're too big. Well, the Ephesians potentially had even more reason to doubt because the man who brought them the gospel is now writing to them from prison. And their confidence in him and his gospel was beginning maybe to start to wane. But clearly, Paul's confidence wasn't waning. When we stop him and look at what he writes in verse 20, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? And if we really let the truth of it confront us, well, it's laughable that my thoughts and dreams are too big for God. Actually, it's the other way round. Because what this verse and the whole of Ephesians teaches us is that my thoughts and visions are actually far too small. Paul says God has the ability and he is genuinely going to do abundantly more than we can possibly think or imagine. What we're beginning to see as we go through the book of Ephesians is that God is actually working on a far grander scale than I'm ever able to comprehend. His plans aren't just confined to here and now, to what I can see in the present. He began them before the beginning of time and he has set the plan in motion for them to be fulfilled in the future on an epic universal stage. What we're beginning to see in this letter is that it's not just us in our local situation, but it's about the whole world, the whole church throughout the whole of history. It's all about God gathering a people from every nation and across all the centuries. It's about the most amazing plan to rescue a people which was fulfilled by Jesus' death and resurrection. It's all about what he has done, is doing and will do for the people he has set his heart and hand on and promised to bring into an eternal inheritance on the day when he finally unites everything under Christ. What God is doing, and as we look at the church, it is genuinely more than we could ever possibly imagine or ask for. And so what we're seeing in Ephesians is that our thoughts and dreams for the church are way too small in comparison to what he's planned. You see, what we often think God is doing is all about me. God is forgiving me. God is saving me and God is helping me and giving me strength. And he is. But we've got to think even bigger, far bigger than that, according to Paul. So as we begin today, we need to ask God to reveal more of himself and his big plan to do more than we can imagine and allow him to blow our minds with it. So let's pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promise that you are uniting all things under Christ. And Lord, we thank you for the mystery that is revealed through Paul's word uh, as, as as you speak through him to us by your spirit. And we pray, Lord, that this, this, this morning as we hear your word Uh, read and as uh, I seek to explain it now Lord that you might speak to us by your spirit that you would reveal to us what you are doing in your plan and that we will see that it is bigger than we could possibly ever have imagined so Lord speak to us today by your spirit in Jesus name amen okay so as we look at this passage today we're going to see that Paul wants us to understand three things Three things about God's plan in this passage in order to give us confidence that he is truly at work in a far bigger and better way than we might ever have believed. And the first is that it is a mysterious plan that he has been given the job of finally revealing. Now, a couple of weeks ago, it was my birthday. And on the morning of my birthday, I was aware that Ruth and the children had prepared me a bit of a mystery surprise. Uh, I was told that I wasn't allowed to come down until they gave me permission, so I had a nice relaxing start to the day. But when I f- uh, was finally allowed down the stairs, as I, as I reached the bottom, I was promptly blindfolded and, and led to the car. Uh, I had no idea where we were going, 
uh, but they said they were taking me on a mystery trip for, for a nice brunch. Now, it was lockdown, so I, I had no idea what this could possibly mean, where we could possibly be going. But about 20 minutes into the journey, the blindfold was uh, removed, and I began to see where we were going. Uh, and when we got out of the car, the children were all holding picnic things, and uh, we began to ascend Leith Hill, which is not far away from here. Many of you will know it. At the top, they made me wait while they set up, and then eventually they revealed this fantastic feast that they prepared for me. It was a beautiful uh, and fantastic treat. Now, in our passage today, Paul refers to God's plan as a mystery. Three times in verses 2 to 6, he calls it a mystery. And in verse 2, he talks about the mystery that was made known to me. He explains his role as an apostle in the language of mystery. So what is this mystery? Well, just as on my birthday, I knew I was being led towards something exciting. But until my blindfold was taken off, the, the specifics were hidden from me. So God's people through the Old Testament had been on a similar but much more significant journey. It was like they had been wearing a blindfold. Because ever since God gave his promise to Abraham, there was an element of mystery about how he could, he could bring it about. He gave them many signs and shadows and, and visions of what it was going to be like. They, they knew he was going to bless them, that he was going to make them a mighty nation and give them a special place to live and that he would be their God and dwell with them. And at times they had experienced something of that. But the specifics were a mystery to them. The full picture of how God would achieve their rescue and of the person of Jesus was beyond their sight. They were to follow God, but they never had full sight of all that he was doing and, and would do. But in this letter to the Ephesians, we see Paul explaining that his role as an apostle was to reveal the mystery. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of many in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul writes to give them confidence in the great plan that God is outworking, that as they receive the gospel from him, they are right at the heart of the plan, because God's great mystery is at last being revealed. And it's not just being revealed to God's historic people, the Jews, but to them, Gentiles. In fact, this is the essence of the mystery. Because the second thing that Paul wants them to understand in order to give them confidence is that the mystery that is revealed is that they are included in the mysterious plan. In chapter 2, we saw Paul had reminded the Ephesians how they were once living without hope, without God, completely cut off from God and his people and his promises. But the heart of the mystery that it is Paul's job to explain, is the reversal of this. Verse 6. The mystery is that the Gentiles are, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Last week we, we saw how this could be, because through Jesus God has broken down the wall of hostility between those who were cut off, the Gentiles, and God's people. So that now they were both part of one family, both brought to God in Christ. Paul was not only given a special insight into this mystery, but he was given a special and unique ministry to take it to the very people it was about. He was given the privilege of taking this message out to the Gentiles. And he travelled around the Middle East and Asia and Europe doing just this. And he did it so that this mystery would no longer be a mystery, but would be revealed for all to see that all people could join the Jews in the promises of God. Now he would always go to the Jews first, but as we observe this in his ministry in the book of Acts, the, the story of the early church, we see it was the Gentiles that more readily received this message, because this was the job that God had given him to do. And this was hard for the Jews to take. It caused them to be jealous and angry, because the amazing part of this ministry was that the Gentiles could now be fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Fellow heirs, it's, it's like the law's, lawyers saying, I've seen the will and you're in it. Paul was telling them that they'd been fully brought into the family. They were equal heirs of the promise. And so as he revealed the mystery to the, the Ephesians and, and they understood and believed, the mystery was being revealed and worked out in them. And Paul was fulfilling his role 
to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. It's a mystery revealed for all people, Jew and Gentile. And Paul wants the Ephesians to know that they are at the heart of it. As they received it from him, God's great plan is being outworked. And this is huge and it is cause for rejoicing also for us. Have you ever considered what a privilege it is to stand this side of the cross? It is no small thing that you have heard and understood the gospel. Prior to Paul and the other apostles revealing it in the middle of the first century, no one had ever heard and understood the fullness of God's plan as we have now. We, just like the Ephesians, have received the answers to a mystery that was kept hidden for ages. The blindfold has been removed and the fullness of God's plan has been revealed. And we, the church, are revealed as part of the answer to that mystery. The fact that we have heard it and believed it is proof that God's plan is working out. 2,000 years later, 3,000 miles away, we have been brought into God's family. But it gets bigger. Paul wants them to know that the fulfilling of God's plan doesn't stop with them. He wants to raise their sights even higher. Because as they understand the mystery, God's plan to make himself known to the heavenly places is fulfilled. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purposes that he has realised in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul says the mystery is revealed and the mystery is you. But the plan doesn't stop with them. God has brought them into his family, the church, so that through them he can make himself known. Through his people, through us. And not just to the world, but to the heavenly places. God's plan is even more far-reaching than taking the mystery out to the Gentiles. He wants to take it out to the entire universe, into the spiritual realm, to every ruler and authority in the heavenly places. Now we could maybe just about imagine that the Ephesians might have reached out to the, the local regions, so uh, maybe some of the local villages and towns would have heard the gospel as people came back with their shopping from the big city. Hey, you want to hear what they're talking about in the big city, they'd be saying. But Paul says to the Ephesians, your role is incomparably bigger than that. The role of the church, that includes us, Christ Church Fetchum. The role of the church is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That is a bigger audience than could ever we could ever have imagined. He's saying, even the things that you most feared, the, the spiritual forces, even they are going to see the wisdom of God through you. He wants the Ephesians to see that in the spiritual realm, God is showing them his church and saying, look what I've done. Look at my prized possession. I've united them. I've broken down the walls of hostility and I'm knitting them together as one united loving body. Look at the Jews and Gentiles in this church loving each other. And the spiritual forces are left flapping. God says, look, look at this church in Fetchum. Look, she is Chinese. This family are Polish. These families were born in Africa. Her family used to be Irish Catholics. And they're all one body, lovingly united as a family. I wonder if any of the children are listening. Uh, and, and, and they've had to do show and tell at school. When my children were in reception at school in Reading, they would have uh, had to do show and tell uh, and they'd had to bring something in to, to, to show the other, people, uh, other children uh, and tell them about it. Now, I remember my son, Josh, he used to like taking his Lego in that he'd built. 
And he'd show off what he created and uh, show it to the children. Well, God loves to show and tell as well. And when he does show and tell, it's his church that he shows. Look at what I've made. Look, look at what has begun. And as the evil spiritual rulers look on, they're panicking. They're quaking. Why? Because it has undone all that the devil has sought to destroy. God's big plan is to unite all things under Jesus as the head. And as he's chosen the church, it's clear that his plan is working. Throughout the world and over the course of history, as diverse groups of people meet together to worship God, as they've grown in love in him and, and of each other, it destroys the devil's schemes to fracture relationships. And more than that, it destroys his scheme to separate mankind from God. Jew and Gentile, every nation, every tongue, are now brought back into the perfect relationship with God that the devil has been working to destroy since the Garden of Eden. The curse that he thought had wrecked their relationship forever has been lifted. His power has been crushed. The church is God's masterpiece. It's his show and tell. And right at the centre of it is Jesus. All of this has been achieved because of Jesus' death on the cross. And as the whole spiritual realm and the whole world look at the cross, they see God's manifold wisdom on display. As his justice, his mercy, his love and uh, are masterfully displayed. As his own son sacrifices himself so that all this can be achieved. He has united a people in Christ. He's shown them their sinful hearts and how Jesus has dealt with their sin. That he's washed them clean with his blood and now calls them to live for him. And he's given them his spirit to transform them. We aren't the finished article, but it has begun. The church are a group of messy, sinful people that God is transforming and changing. And it's for a purpose far greater than we imagine. It's so that the character of God himself can be seen. And Satan hates it. The spiritual forces of evil hate it. The devil loves the riots that are going on in America at the moment. He, he's at the heart of those riots. He's at the heart of that hatred. He loves racism. He loves the fear and anger that it causes. He loves the way it drives people and nations apart. And as we look at it, we cry. Because what we're seeing is a picture of the world as Satan wants it. As we see the hatred and the anger and the fear, we cry out for an answer. We cry out for unity and love. And there's only one answer. There's only one way that all this will be stopped. Jesus. There is no social solution to a spiritual problem. Skin colour isn't the problem. Sin is our problem. Prejudice, murder, lust, anger, covetousness, jealousy are all heart attitudes before they're in action. It's our hearts that are the problem. We need someone to reconcile our hearts. We need new hearts. And this is only found in Christ. This is the work that Christ has begun in those who trust him. He has reconciled us to him and given us new hearts. And that's why why the church provides a different picture as the nations are united in the church a profound hope is revealed that cannot be found anywhere else it might not be the picture that we see broadcasted on our tv screens but but across the world god is reconciling people in christ from every nation to himself it's real and it's happening and as the spiritual realms see this mystery revealed a united body of believers under christ being put together <clears throat> They know it means defeat. It is defeat for the spiritual forces that are driving a wedge between us and God and causing division and wars between mankind. It has begun. The church is a visual aid. In fact, it's much more than that. It's, it's a, a little enacted piece of heaven where Jesus, Jesus is the head and all people are united in love as the whole universe will be one day where there will finally be an end to hatred and racism, an end to war and disease, an end to all suffering. Because much as it might not always look that way, God is taking all of the brokenness 
and the sorrow and the sickness and the pain and piecing it all together under Christ. That's bigger than my vision. That's bigger than anything you can imagine. So Paul says, verse 13, I ask you not to lose heart. Paul knows the Ephesians have the potential to doubt, to, to lose heart, to fear that God is not powerful enough to fulfil his promises. Remember that the Ephesians have trusted in gods before who've let them down. Remember they, they used to worship Artemis until Paul told them uh, the worthlessness of worshipping such a, a, a fake. And here are the Ephesians who have put their trust in Jesus. And they're finding that life is hard and that the realities of God's promises are not always easily seen. And here is an imprisoned man trying to convince them that God is powerful. A God who allows his apostles to get banged up is not one you might choose to follow. But Paul says his physical imprisonment is not the eternal reality. Just as our difficulties and, and troubles and the things that cause us doubt, as real as they are to us now, they're not the big picture. Paul isn't worried about prison because he has the best job in the world. And the world is being saved through the ministry God has given him to do. He says, do not lose heart. The rulers and authorities in the spiritual realm look at you and are in awe. They panic. The reality is that God has an eternal perspective. He has a plan, an eternal purpose that he has realised in Christ that has begun and will be completed. God is achieving more than we can possibly imagine. We just need to have spiritual eyes to see it. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God is doing something far bigger than we can even comprehend. We need to think big and pray big that God would do more than we can possibly imagine. And we're going to think a bit more about that in Ephesians next week. But now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done in Christ. Lord, we thank you that, that he is the answer to all the problems of this world. That in Christ, we can find unity and love and peace and reconciliation. We thank you that in Christ, we are given new hearts. That his spirit comes to live in us, to transform us, to change us. And Lord, as we consider this, would we pray big? Lord, we ask that you might show us your great plan. That you would bring many to know you in this area, Lord. That you would use us, your church, to reach out with your gospel. That we would see people from, from all around, from all nations, united by the gospel. And Lord, we thank you that we, your church, are a picture of that already. Lord, what a blessing that is to us. And we pray that that would be a blessing to others around as they see the love that we have. Would it draw them to yourself? Lord, we thank you that you are in the, in, in the process of doing more that we, than we can imagine as you unite all things under Christ. Lord, help us to trust you in all of this. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning as a, a people who recognise our sin before a holy God. We know from Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as we know from the Ten Commandments, the standard you have set is not a standard that we can obtain. Lord God, that truth cuts through all church tradition, all hierarchy, all attempts at elevating men and preachers. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. There isn't one of us um, listening to this stream this morning that isn't in desperate need of saving from the situation that we find ourselves in. A situation where we are falling on a daily basis short of the standard that God has set. A standard of perfection and a standard which is, we just have no hope of meeting. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided a way back to God from that deep pit that we find ourselves in. That way back to you is through the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he's done on the cross for each of us. The perfect life that he's led and the perfect sacrifice he's made as he gave up his life as a ransom for the many, including all of us listening to this stream today. There's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves, but we want to thank you, Lord, for the, the grace that you've given to your people. Grace that turns our sinful, rebellious hearts away from the sin that so easily entangles our lives. Grace that turns our hearts towards Christ. As we trust in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the work that he's done upon the cross, we know that our relationship with you is repaired. You no longer look on our sin and the filthy rags that we call our good deeds. No, when we put our trust in Christ, you no longer look at our sin at all. It is covered entirely and utterly wiped out supernaturally by your son and the life that he led. Amazingly, when you look at us, you see Christ's perfection and his sinless life covering our sinful hearts and desires. We, guilty sinners though we are, can stand perfect in Christ before you, a holy God who cannot even look upon sin. Even more so, we can come with boldness in prayers like this and we can make requests and petitions of this holy, all-powerful God who listens and answers to those prayers. Not because of anything in ourselves, but only because of the work of Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for the, the bride of Christ, the church. This church with all of its flaws, with all of its sinners, is described in the Bible as the very bride of Christ. The bride because we've been washed by Christ. The bride because we're presented spotless before the throne of God. The bride because the church's mission is to present the work of Christ on the cross to a guilty and perishing world. Lord, you have preserved your church throughout the ages because it is your chosen instrument to bring the glory of your great gospel to the whole world. We thank you, Lord, that as members of your local church, we're fulfilling that work this morning, even separated as we are. We pray, Lord, that we might be diligent in that great calling that you've given each of us. We glory, Lord, in the fact that this isn't the only church that is virtually meeting together like this in your name today. All over the UK and across the world, there are groups of Christians meeting as churches and living out your commandments to make disciples of all nations. We want to pray this morning for anyone in the church who hasn't been well this week. Lord, we ask that they would know your healing even today, Lord, and that they might soon be restored to health. We pray for any who are feeling lonely at this time and ask, Lord, that you might find their comfort, um, that you might be their comfort in scripture and that they might know you as they read your word. Draw near to them, Lord, and be pleased to reveal yourself to them even in the depths of this difficult time. Lord, we are so grateful for the religious freedoms that we have in this country to fulfill the Great Commission without fear or repercussions. Even at this time of isolation, Lord, show us ways in which we can present the gospel clearly to those you bring to us in contact with. Lord, we 
may not always have the opportunity to witness openly in this country, cause us to lift up our eyes and look at the fields for the, the they are already white with the harvest. Today, Lord, we are free to speak to our neighbours about the gospel. Yes, Lord, we can even persuade them of the truth. And yet, how often do we do this? Forgive us, Lord, that we do not take the opportunities that you give us more often. Make us acutely aware of the privileges that we have in this country and lead our hearts to take advantage of those privileges. Lord, we want to pray for the leaders of our country. We pray for, for Boris Johnson and ask, Lord, that you would grant him wisdom in the difficult decisions he has to make at this time. We pray for Keir Starmer and the other opposition leaders that everyone in government would be blessed by you, that you would grant them long life, prosperity and, and success in their endeavours. Lord, we ask that you would bless us as a local congregation of your people, a local display of God's sovereign plan to bring the gospel to the world. Even at this time when we can't meet together in person, the church, the very bride of Christ, Lord, we ask that you would bless us as we conclude our service this morning, as we ponder on the word of God as it has been preached to us, grant us understanding. Might we be a people this morning that open our hearts to the scriptures and to you, Lord. Might we be challenged by what we hear and ultimately, Lord, might it make us more like you as we glorify you through this act of worship. We ask all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you.